Hi guys, I'm Shmi. Hello and welcome back to the channel where today we're rewinding to before my US tour for a first drive in this, the new Lotus Emira. Now the Emira is a future Shmi-mobile. Mine will be delivered in a couple of months in a very similar specification to the car that I'm gonna be experiencing today, which is this rather lovely first edition in Hethel Yellow. We've got the manual gearbox, the supercharged V6. We'll talk about all of the details and the different configurations today that you can order for the Amira, a very important car for Lotus. It replaces in their sports car lineup all of the existing models, the Elise, the Exige, and the Evora with this, their last purely petrol-powered model they will ever make. So today, a full look then. We'll kick off with a walk around, then we're gonna hop on board to go out for a drive to learn all about it in the fantastic Lotus Amira. <music> Firstly, a walk around. There's a lot to take in with Amira, a car that is very important for Lotus as a brand as well, but also the end of the previous generation. They've completed production of the models that we've known from recent years. And of course, in not too long, things are heading electric. We've seen Avaya, the electric hypercar, and Electra, the recently launched electric SUV, ahead of more models to come. So this, as Lotus put it, is their last combustion engine vehicle, Amira. And my word, when this was presented at the Goodwood Festival of Speed last year, did it disrupt the market. Most notably and impressively is that this car in first edition guise, which has a very high level of standard specification, starts from only 76,000 pounds with looks like this. It looks like a supercar, the dual tone paint scheme, the proportions, the shapes around it. It's a mid-engine rear driven configuration, but the price point is that of a sports car. And we'll head out and experience the 400 horsepower and talk about that on the road very shortly. But in terms of the design and styling, we'll head around this now, the footprint is tiny. It's smaller than a 911, but has those wonderful shapes around it. You can tell the styling is heavily influenced by Evaya. They've brought that down, the baby supercar almost, you could say, the new design, the new style, everything completely updated from the models that have come before. There's going to be a choice of engine configurations. The V6 arrives first, the four cylinder will come later. With this configuration, you have two different gearboxes, either the manual or opt for the automatic. With the four cylinder, there will be a dual clutch. As we come around towards the front though, these are the features I love. This shape for airflow and management, again, like on a Via. The lower sections of the bumper, which obviously are heavily open for cooling, are very similar to older models. We have the final last Elise Cup 250 just here, and you could recognize the same kind of shapes in the lower sections of the front obviously for that cooling. Now this particular car, like I said, first edition, there are only six colors available. This is Hethel yellow. There's Seneca blue, the launch color, two grays, the green uh, and a red as well with a few options, but not really all that many. We've got the dual tone 20 inch twin V-spoke designed wheels, the optional black calipers. We have the black contrast pack for the car, so the mirrors, the roof, and a couple of other elements as well around it. But there's not all that much you can choose and spec with this. And that's one of the things I think that makes it, like I said, really impressive. Now I've got the key for the car here, the new design that Lotus have gone with for the key for a mirror. And in fact, if we press and hold to open this up, we have the engine back here with a lovely view of it, to be honest. So this is the Toyota sourced 3.5 liter supercharged V6 that we know from a number of Lotus models. We've got 400 horsepower. In the manual, we have 420 Newton meters. In the automatic, you have 430 Newton meters. The manual will do the zero to 100 kilometer an hour, 62 mile per hour sprint in 4.3 seconds. The auto will take that down to 4.2 and both will go to a top speed of 290 kilometers an hour, 180 miles per hour. The mid-engine configuration is of course a driver's dream, but there is still a little bit of luggage space back here. You can fit some bags in behind. Might be a little bit conscious about the heat from the engine, but also plenty of space behind the seats. It's a very usable and friendly car, despite its very small configuration. Now, if we come around and have a look inside just here, show you the interior of this, it's entirely new for Lotus. This is a Lotus with practicality, with comfort and with technology, but notably check out the six speed shifter in the center and look right below it where you have those exposed linkages, which to be honest, are just plain cool. Now inside here, we've got cup holders, we've got storage bins, we've got electric lumbar adjustable seats. We've got the steering wheel with various controls. We've got the digital dashboard display, the 12 inch screen, and also the 10 and a quarter inch central infotainment display as well. We also have a 
sound system provided by KEF, the 10 speaker system with 340 watts. As I said, it is a Lotus unlike any other, and we will explore the interior in detail when we return. On the exterior, some small touches. For example, the Amira first edition plaque. I will be taking delivery of one rather like this, in fact. And that's why I took the opportunity to drive this car today with being away in the USA means I've been unable to drive the full production car, but with production beginning really quite soon, this is one of the final prototypes, which is about 95% of the way there and a fabulous opportunity to hop on board for a first drive. So I suppose we should probably go get it started and get ready to take this out to go and experience it for the first time. Let me do this. I haven't actually at this point taken the car out since it was dropped off here at the Museum. But I tell you what, the sounds of it are really quite impressive. So start button in the center. Let me press the clutch and the brake. Not bad, hey? All right, let's go out. Let's go see what a mirror is like. My plan here is to share my thoughts literally as we go. So I've been driving for a couple of minutes, getting a small feel for what this car is like, and I wanna jump straight into something that is not the best, which I rather suspect that Evora customers might be experienced with, and that's this very Lamborghini Diablo Murcielago style offset steering wheel pedals seat. So from where I am sat, the steering wheel is notably to the left, the pedals are notably to the right. Now, I will point out, I am in a left-hand drive car, because this car will be heading off to Europe for various different things. Whereas of course here in the UK, we drive in right-hand drive cars. So I can't speak for the right-hand drive configuration. I'm in tour at the moment though. So let's move on to the good stuff. And this is where, to be honest, it instantly feels like a lively, exciting sports car. Exactly what you want a Lotus to be for the drivers, exactly what it is. And obviously we're out on some nice twisty countryside style roads, exactly where a car like this is completely at home and in tour mode it's very quiet you hear a little bit of the supercharger and the sounds from behind but it's not a full-on noise cacophony as you get when you open it up into sport or then into track modes now with the sport chassis setup there is no adaptive suspension so whether you're in tour sport or track it's always at the firmer end that does mean it's very dialed in it's set up very nicely when you're going through the corners it does also mean that it is quite fidgety when you're out on a regular road. And those who like a softer ride, I thoroughly recommend to go for the tour configuration. It feels like the kind of ride that you would have in a limited edition track special supercar. It's not unpleasant, but it's certainly at the firmer end with no adaptive nature to it. So if we turn it up then into sport mode, it tells me enhanced performance. The powertrain and exhaust open up a little bit more. Stability is still on full. Obviously when we then go into track, stability dials down a little bit and everything gets even more wild. But this is where you get so much supercharger noise. You get that whine, and especially if you then put down the window, the sounds that we get from it. We're gonna have a nice acceleration just in a moment with the car ahead pulling off, so into gear, nice clunk to that. Let's uh, enjoy this. That sounds pretty cool to me. You get that whine as you go up through the revs. You've got a lovely feel to the shifter, as I said, and it would have been embarrassing almost if they didn't manage to get that perfectly spot on. So that was to be expected. It's great to blip it down. That's when you get lots of burbles. Perhaps you could say a little bit too artificial, but this is where the suspension feels really dialed in. You know, our UK roads are famed for being pretty rough and bumpy, but it manages to do a nice job of riding over them, keeping composed, even if perhaps out on the highways, that's where it'd be a little bit too aggressive throw it in through the corners, lots of grip, even more grip if you have the optional cup twos. <laughs> it feels quite good, I'm just hoping I can get away from following a cement mixer because that's not gonna make for the best countryside lane driving. It's now a little bit more open. This is exactly what we want. The steering wheel I need to comment on. It's too chunky for me. There's this new thing for manufacturers with making steering wheels as chunky as they possibly can. Down here where it's a little bit bumpier, I'm certainly feeling thrown around a little bit. Gosh, that noise up towards the top end of the rev range is just fantastic. Pedals are great. Blipping it manually, there's no auto blip. This is a car that's all about you as the driver. It's about being connected with it, about having an amazing time behind the wheel of it. And just dropping the gears, shifting it around, going down these lanes. 
This is exactly what a Lotus is made to do. So you can probably tell it is firm. To be honest, probably thinking retrospectively, I would have ordered the tour setup. I think it is definitely very much at the track end if you have the sport configuration. But I do like the Cup 2 tyres, and that was a big part of it for me. You want to be at the top end of the rev range, you want to enjoy some of those sounds, and you have a fabulous view in the rear view mirror of the throttle linkage opening and closing as you're back on and off the throttle, which is really fantastic actually to be able to see when you catch a quick glimpse of it as you're looking backwards. To be honest, this is a car that is just about being fun and unlike any previous Lotus, the amount of technology in here, the storage areas for your phone, for your drinks, for everything around, having digital displays like this, who would have thought from the previous generation Lotus models, the Elise, the Xe, usually Evora, that this is what was going to come next. You feel like you're in a supercar, the seating position, looking out over the low front scuttle, the high arches for the front wheels, it feels very much of an ilk that you would expect to be priced at two or three times this. Yes, the performance, you know, it's fast. It's just over four seconds at 62 miles an hour, but it's not supercar fast. It's a level of speed where if you want to rev it out, there you go to the top of the rev range and you get that amazing sound. In fact, popping the window down, you hear a lot more just in through the left-hand side. So for European drivers or American drivers, this car will be in the US market. You hear plenty more of that. That's such a cool noise than those of us here in right-hand drive regions are typically gonna get. The front end is very playful, but also planted, committed. It's the kind of feeling you would expect from a sports car. It feels very Lotus. It's very definitively Lotus. Now, obviously, this particular car isn't 100% completed. They're very near that stage, very near putting it into production. And I think mine should be turning up before too long. And I'm looking forward, obviously, to seeing exactly what that's like but to get this first opportunity to drive the car and to now obviously be able to share it with the lifting of the embargo it's really quite special this is a car that is a big deal and i said it was a market disruptor and believe me from driving it it definitely is to have this much at this performance you know this is well new m2 that kind of region this is a lot of car for the money this is a lot of car for the money one thing this really makes you want to do is just drive it. And you know what? A lot of modern cars are losing the passion, the emotion, the soul. But this makes you want to have the window down. It makes you want to be up towards the top of the rev range, as I said. It makes you want to just rev it out a little bit. And thankfully, my speedo is in kilometers per hour. I'm not driving at 90 miles an hour down here. But because of the, let's say, almost slight lack of power compared to supercars, you can get to the top of it. You can rev it up. You can have fun with it. You can have a connection with it. And that noise is just so cool. Oh, that sounds good. That sounds so good. So let me pop it up into track mode, which pops everything, powertrain and exhaust, into their most dialed up settings and pulls back stability a little bit in the process. Although on a nice dry day like today, I don't think we're going to have any problems. Slightly different sound out of it. Oh, those noises. It's just connected. You quickly forget about this offset setup that's all a little bit all over the place. That becomes irrelevant because your focus is on the road up ahead of you. Everything's natural. Everything's where you want it to be. Everything is how it should be. This is what this car wants you to do. Those lovely snaps that you sometimes get from it as well. It wants to be enjoyed and it wants to be driven. It doesn't feel like it's sitting waiting to be, let's say, daily and cruised. And obviously the different gearbox configurations are going to give different experiences, different feedback, different types of driving. I feel though, especially with the sport configuration, this is a car to have with the manual box. Perhaps an auto and a tour is gonna to give you a different vibe. It's a car that looks amazing. Perhaps it will be more of a daily, let's say a cool car to daily that doesn't stretch the budget and stretch the boat out too far. But like this, I mean, how cool is this? How ridiculously cool is this? Like I said, you quickly forget its foibles and you remember that you're in a lot of car for the limited amount of money that you've spent on it. And I've not played yet too much with the infotainment and the electronics in here. And we'll, you know, get to all of that when we get out the other end and get back towards the Museum. But we're gonna drive as well on some regular dual carriageways and motorway. I just wanna get a feel for that type of environment as well. Although before that, there's more of this, drop down the gears, point the front end, and off you go again. Spectacular. And being small, being nimble, 
it just blasts down country lanes. What a delight. What a delight. I hoped I was going to like it, obviously, because I've ordered one and put my money down a long time ago, in fact. A long time hoping that when it launched it was going to be fantastic. And then when I got to see it for the first time and had to keep my mouth shut before being able to launch the video, that was tricky. That was really tricky because this is very exciting. Now, obviously, two completely different products here in the Lotus portfolio. At one end you have the Amira, the let's say ultimate driver's sports car. At the other end, you have Electra, the over five meters large luxury SUV. And that's obviously the way automotive is heading. That's the way the market is heading. And for those of us who are purists and who love our cars, obviously this is what we want to see more of. Let's just hope that more of this is what we can have in the future. Let's hope that there is a way that these things can continue to exist. Because on a lovely day like today, on a road like this, there's not much else I would rather be doing than driving and just driving. Just driving and driving. That's it, driving. And this is the tool for the occasion. On the dual carriageway then, down to second gear, foot down, build the power. <laughs> it really builds up very nicely. You know, yes, it's not flying up through the revs. You know, it's not like a V10 or something mad like that. But what it is, is a lot of fun. It's very emotional. It's very much for the driver. It's very focused. This particular car is super bright yellow. Open it up again. Everything feels very natural. You know where you're going with the gear shifter. You know where you are with the pedals. They're quite close together. Heel and toe is gonna to be great. Just drop it down. I'm just having fun with the gearbox. You know, long live the manual, save the manuals, any of these phrases, because we need these in our lives. We need them to stick around. I do find eventually, after the ball knob that you have here, with the engravings on the top, you do actually feel it a little bit with your palm. It's not quite like using a soft shifter of some description. I'm certainly aware of that, but that's a personal thing at the end of the day. Seats are quite firm, but I have grown accustomed to them from my drive so far. I'm gonna pop it back into tour mode now that we're just chilling here a little bit. The dashboard changes depending which mode you have it in. You get different colors and different layouts and different styles out of it. Uh, and it moves everything around a bit. Obviously with this being a Euro spec car, the mile per hour display is actually tiny, which doesn't help my life all that much. But you've got great visibility in here, good sized door mirrors, lots of view out of the front. The rear, not the best, directly backwards, but you do have the quarter windows behind the seats, which give you a little perspective of what might be in your blind spot. So those aren't too troubling. Those actually work out pretty fine. Uh, and even though it's a left-hand drive car, I've not had too much of an issue with that uh, driving here so far. I'm just cruising along now, just cruising along, enjoying the drive. Um, sound system is good, perhaps not the best, but it's not exactly bad. Uh, and there's a lot of information you can see through the system. Although the color scheme used is really tricky to see. Everything is quite small. So in this screen, which is pivoted far down in the very center, it's actually tricky for the driver to see that. Um, gonna have a nice acceleration again, so I'm gonna go back. Actually, let's go back into track, drop it straight down to second gear all of those burbles out of it. Straighten out the roundabout, back on the power. Nice, very nice. <laughs> I think the little yellow Lotus nearly didn't get seen there. But anyway, we are off again. I expected that this might be a bit too fidgety at higher speeds, but to be honest, it's not all that bad. And I quite like a dynamic drive, you know, I'm into it. So for me, it's not just an A to B method of transport. Something like this is to enjoy each and every mile that you spend on the road. And I find that, yeah, okay, it keeps you a little bit on your toes, but it's very nicely sorted. And you're back on the power again, the supercharger wind up to the red line. You just want to hear that sound all day long. You just want to constantly rev it out. Oh, there's an E-Type. I hope they're okay, not overheating or something perhaps. The, oh well. Um, yeah, so nice, nice all round drive this. So let me gather my thoughts a little bit more as we head back towards base. And there's a lot more that I want to show you inside the new Lotus Emira. Back at the barn and plenty more still to show you around here. The infotainment it's taken me a little bit of getting used to it. It's completely and totally new compared to anything I know. But before that, we'll need to shut it off quickly just to show you the display mode. So you can see on the dashboard, we're in the tour mode at the moment. If we pop it up into sport mode, everything will then change. You can hear the valves open 
goes red. Sounds pretty cool. If we then go into track mode, you get a completely different display as well with the horizontal rev counter across the top. Really nice. Now, one thing that's a little bit confusing, also get the graphics on here, is when you have just the ignition on, but not the engine. So if we turn it off, if you press the button, which you can do going through the red flap or lift up the red flap, it's really disconcerting as to whether anything's actually on. There are very few signs. Most cars, you have more of a sense of it. Anyway, let me show you through here. We've got the performance and tire pressure displays at the moment. You can go through a few different screens, get various bits of data and your statistics in there. Same on this side, your radio, and then your Bluetooth for your phone. You've got the tiles in here, which give you a whole host of different things that you can see. And I always enjoy this kind of stuff, being able to just go through different menus and screens and play and tap around with it all. You've got a storage cubby just here for your phone, your climate control on either side, although these are oddly awkward because they're pointed slightly down. They're really hard to actually get to. It's an unusual little bit of the design. Your driving mode selector, your volume control hazards in the middle, but then of course this, which is really good. It's just so cool how it's exposed down below with that casing. Um, this flap, which like I say, Honestly, it feels trying too much to be a Lamborghini. It's a little bit fiddly and awkward. And there's a weird lag when you press start. So on the count of three, one, two. And that confuses you what it's actually doing and whether it's starting up or what's going on with that. Anyway, let's switch it back off. We've got the cup holders here. We've got a storage cubby with a regular USB and a USB-C. It's probably quite hard to see, but there's a decent amount of space behind. Um, the Evora was of course a 2 plus 2 with some little seats back there, so if you consider the size of the car overall, you could fit some decent amounts of luggage um, back there and have plenty with you on the road. On the steering wheel, you have these touch pads effectively on either side, so you can either use it as a touch pad and go up through the different screens or you can physically press it, depending which you prefer, and get all of that data on your main screen. Then on the left side, you have your additional controls as well. So there's a lot you can go through. It's quite a small steering wheel with a flat bottom, which looks cool. But like I say, the grip is just a little bit too chunky to hold comfortably. And it would be nice for me if it was slightly smaller, more old school Lotus and less the newer style that we have on here. But it's nicely finished. And that's what's perhaps the most bizarre about this. You know, the trims, the details, not huge amounts of headroom. I mean, I'm not particularly tall, but it works fine for me. Um, entry and exit with the sills just here, slightly awkward to step over, but again, not the worst in the world. And to be honest, for a Lotus, this interior is completely a step ahead. It's a completely different game to anything that's ever been before. Just down to all of the small touches and design elements like the Amira logo on the air conditioning vent controls just there. All of those types of things that make it feel like a quality car and make you, as I said earlier, quickly forget the foibles. Anyway, let's step back out. Back outside the car, one thing I didn't mention earlier, which is quite unusual, is this design here. This black rubber strip that you have running across the front, which to me is just a little bit unsightly. I don't know if on the production cars that will change slightly, perhaps be less prominent. As you can see, the yellow is attracting all of the flies and bugs. Now, driving it, the Tour car basically has a slightly softer spring rate, but I don't think it's all that much. So, despite what I might have said earlier, probably the Sport is the right setup and is what I would choose. What you really feel, though, is that the steering is so sharp and tiny in its amount of input that it requires. And that's what obviously I was saying when we were driving on the country lanes, you just kind of point and it darts off and heads in that direction. Feels like it has plenty more grip or anything beyond what I've been trying to do with it. Just lots of extra details I spot here in the headlights. Check out the little Amira logo and graphic inside there. Those things that just make it feel more premium than you would expect of this kind of car at this price point. You know, this is head to head against the Cayman GT4 and I make no secret I'm a big GT4 fan. I had a 981, I had a 718. And this is exactly in that segment. I think it does it though with more sense of excitement and occasion and slightly less of the clinical precision. But that means that when you get it right, you get it right and it feels really, really good as a result. So Lotus Emira, first drive in a car that 
we know is a big success for the brand. There is a huge waiting list already. They are very, very popular. And this is just where it begins with the V6. It would be great to experience down the line as well. As I said, the two litre turbo four cylinder with the dual clutch gearbox that comes from the team at AMG. And well, I'm a big fan of the AMG, so I'm sure that will be a fantastic setup in one of these very, very quick as well. But today, what an opportunity to drive it. Really, really cool and well worth getting the opportunity to do so before being out in the US, where very promptly, depending how this goes, I shall return. For today though, thank you very much for watching as always guys. I appreciate your support an awful lot. Thank you to Lotus for delivering the car to me here at the Sh Museum to share my experiences with you. Next up, we'll be taking delivery of mine not very long from now and having a lot of fun with it. So stay tuned for that. That's all for now though. So thank you very much for watching and I'll see you very soon. Cheers.